Welcome to this week's episode of Shapes of Grief. Um, I'm, I know I say this every week that I'm so thrilled to be joined by, but I am particularly thrilled this week to be joined by Dr. Mary Frances O'Connor, all the way from Arizona. Mary Frances, you're really welcome. Oh, so lovely to be here, Liz. I've actually been reading your work for over a decade. Um, wow. I did a thesis about eight years ago, nine years ago, how grief manifests in the body. Ah. Um, and so your name came up quite a lot. So it was very exciting to me when you launched your book, The Grieving Brain. But let me just tell listeners a little bit about you before we dive in. Um, Mary Frances is a leading researcher in the field of grief. Uh, you've been doing work for many, many years. You are a specialist. I don't like to say expert. I think you'd say <laughs> that yourself. You're a specialist in prolonged grief disorder, um, mm -hmm. which I'd love to touch on later on because I sure. work with many people with prolonged grief disorder. Also, you're an associate professor at the University of Arizona, where you teach about grief and loss to your students. And like I mentioned, author of The Grieving Brain. That's right. Thank you so much for your time. I know you're you're busy and you have a busy schedule and I really appreciate your willingness to come to speak to Shapes of Grief listeners today. Um, let's start with the book, actually, The Grieving sure. Brain. And in your opinion, how is this book helping people who grieve? Well, the work that I do is what we call basic science. And I don't mean basic science in that it's super simple, but I mean basic science in that I'm really, you know, wrestling with questions like, why does grief hurt so much? And why does it take us so long to understand that our loved one is really gone? And how does the brain figure all of that out? How do, the, how do we encode these relationships? And so while my background is in clinical psychology and also neuroscience. Um, my work is very much about the why and the how. And so when people are connecting with the grieving brain, the book, uh, I think it's because many of us want to understand the why. And, you know, I'm not a person who believes we can give advice to people who are grieving. And so what I find interesting is they seem to take the the why as I see it and then apply it to their own life in a way that makes sense for their own grief or their own experience or their own clients or you know whomever their their uh, grief is is focused with and so by writing a book like this my goal was really I'm you know doing these research studies every day as you said for a long time and working with colleagues who are doing these studies but I realized that none of that information was really getting into the hands of people who could actually use it and so the book for me was like you know sitting next to someone on an airplane and trying to sort of tell them what I know about the 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 science of grief and and then you know, give them a little bit of how that might have applied to my own life as a way to understand why I think it's important. Yeah, great. I think it's so important. And you've talked about grieving as a learning process. And in my mm -hmm. experience, as someone who supports people who grieve, they want to learn. We want, yes. we want to learn. Yes. When we're having this profound experience, many of us want to understand why am I feeling this? Why yeah. am I not feeling that? What is happening in my brain? Why can't I sleep at night? Why yeah. have I got a pain in my chest? Yeah. And I think it's so important we don't underestimate people. You know, not like showing up as a compassionate presence is everything. It, it really is. It's, it's so much. It's so important. But I remember my first day in college, and I've said this before, and it was uh, learning the theories and models of grief. And I remember sitting there going, Everybody needs to know this. Yeah. This is information that the world needs, not just the 16 of us sitting here. Right. And so that bridge that you're talking about, taking the science, how do we make it digestible for people who need the information um, is something I'm, I'm right beside you on. Yes. Um, so important. So could we maybe look at that grief as a learning process? 
because it is we we think grief is just a sad time after someone we love dies it's so much more what do we need to learn would you take yeah. us through it? well I think you know thinking of it as a form of learning it, it just it makes a lot of sense but it also I think makes it a little more familiar um so we're learning all the time you know um and I think when we think of it as learning, it also helps to understand why it doesn't necessarily end, right? So I think of it this way, if, you know, there's such an obsession in our society about when does this end? You know, when, when, when am I done? When is closure? When am I over it? When have I moved on? You know, and I just don't think that often reflects the experience that people have. And so I sometimes think of it this way, you know, you can ask the question, uh, when did you get over your wedding day? You know, which isn't really a question that makes any sense, does it? And and if I say to you, do you know, do you think you're better at marriage than you were, say, three, four years ago? You, you probably say yes. And if I said, do you think there's still more things you could learn about being a married person? You'd probably also say yes, right? And so I think, although that sounds a little strange as an analogy, I think being a bereaved person is the same idea, right? This event has happened, the death of someone so close and so important in your life. And you're going to have all sorts of reactions to that. But over time, you're also going to learn how is it to be a grieving person? What does it mean to be, what does it mean to be a parent if my child has died? What does it mean to be a widow instead of a married person? And that's not something that just ends at, you know, 6.5 weeks. That is an ongoing process. How do I honor my loved one? How do I maybe carry forward their, their values uh, in what I do in sort of meaningful activities or, how do I still rely on them for advice and, you know, the conversations that you may have with them? Um, so there are so many ways that all of this is is really a form of learning. Um, and, and hopefully that sort of takes a little of the pressure off. Yeah. And that it's a process. It's an ongoing yes. process. I love, you know, one of the things I loved about your book is it's like, oh, I picked that too, or I experienced yes. that. And it's just so affirming to hear someone with your wisdom say it as a fact. It's like, okay, you know, um, but one thing, you know, when, when someone dies suddenly or unexpectedly, we're so shocked and maybe our family is shocked and our community is shocked. And we behave as if death is just this random thing that only strikes certain people. Yeah. Do you think that that's a result of adaptation, that if we thought about death too much, we'd lose our meaning and our purpose? Or is it a result of our sanitized capitalistic society that values production over life? Mm. You know, I think it's actually quite a few things that have all kind of come together at the same time. Um, I I think some of it is simply, you know, our life expectancy is longer and and infant mortality is much, much lower than ever before in history. And that simple, just that simple demographic change means that fewer of us experience the death of someone close to us early in our lives. That is, of course, not to say that everyone uh, doesn't there that there aren't many people who who experience that. But as a society, we have fewer opportunities, really, to learn what it means when a loved one dies and to have close friends or close family who have experienced a death. And so there's that piece. I think there's also the piece that the dying process itself has very much been moved behind closed doors. It's been very medicalized and there are reasons for that, but it is much more common now for people to die in a hospital than at home. And, and also, you know, even our, our funerals, you know, it's a funeral director who is uh, doing caring for the body instead of the family or the neighborhood, in fact. Um, and so all of these reasons, I think just, they they give us less experience with grief and with death and 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 i think that the things that you say are also true that we're very concerned as a 
as a society with each individual being very happy, right? That is the, that is the goal. And, you know, that's not all of, of human experience. It's just not. And so if we are really preferencing that state, then you end up leaving out a lot of what people are experiencing. But I will also say, I, I have, as you said, been doing this work for a long time. And my experience is that there are many more conversations about grief and loss now than there were 10 years ago, that podcasts like this just did not exist 10 years ago. And many types of, you know, media and educational tools and therapists who are specialists and, you know, all of those things are really rather new. And I see a real culture shift for us. Yeah, it is. It's really interesting. And I think, you know, when we look at the research, and I've heard you say this in other podcasts and George Bonanno's, you know, longitudinal studies over decades, we know that most people have a normal adaptive response to loss and don't need professional intervention. And we also know that there's a certain cohort of people who do maybe need something extra. Um, And maybe that's because they've experienced a sudden death or a traumatic loss or it was unexpected, or for a variety of reasons, it's like this same expression I use all the time, someone takes a, a sledgehammer to their nervous system, you know, and it's like grief touches every cell of the body, mm-hmm. you know, in those cases. For some yeah. of us, it's, you know, it's just little grief waves that come now mm-hmm. and again, you know, my father died last year, mm-hmm. and that's how I experience mm-hmm. my grief of him, I'll have moments of nostalgia. Yeah. But I'm getting on with my life in a very normal way. Um, yeah. and, and, and my grief for him feels integrated and manageable. Yes. I've had other losses where it's literally brought me to my knees. Yeah. And, and that feeling of, I remember saying to myself, it'll be okay in six months. Yeah. And then six months comes, it'll be, maybe it just needs another six. I'll be okay in 12. Yeah. And then at 18 months realizing, shit, this, this is not it. This isn't going away. Yeah. Damn, this is what they <laughs> meant in the book. Yes. And it's this phenomenon of knowing something with your part of your brain. Yeah. But fully understanding it. Yeah. And accepting it's real with your body, with your cells is a whole other thing. Yeah. And you explain this beautifully in your book. Would you? take our listeners through that I know they're dead right yet I can't fathom this yes well I think in in acute grief this happens to so many people and and more so when it's unexpected but you know I think if there's one thing I've learned it's that grief almost never feels like the way you expect that it's going to feel um and so you know, you can't really talk about grief without talking about love and talking about bonding. And so we know that when you fall in love with the person will, who will become your spouse or you fall in love with your baby, um, that that physically changes your brain, right? That that literally rearranges the proteins in your brain, in your epigenetics, in your neural firing patterns. And so once that bond has been set up, this is my one and only, which comes with this belief that is just so enduring and important, which is, I will always be there for you and you will always be there for me. Once that has been set up, then we are necessarily going to have grief if we're separated from that person or if that person dies, if we're permanently separated from them, because the brain is expecting them and predicting their presence and suddenly has to make sense of the fact that they're not present. And the challenge is it has a solution for when our loved ones aren't present. And the solution is go get them, right? Or make enough of a fuss that they come and get you. Mm. And so the the trouble is the brain has a solution for this problem and the solution doesn't work in this case. And so what you end up having is these two streams of information at the same time that your brain can quite happily hold these two streams of information that can't both be true. On the one hand, 
You may have memories of having been present when your loved one died or getting that terrible phone call or uh, being at a funeral or memorial. So you can recall, you can say to people, I know that this person has died. And at the same time, that attachment neurobiology is also saying they're out there somewhere. Yeah. Right. And you think so they think you see them or yes, exactly. Them, or you drive down their road. Yes. Describe these scenarios all the time. Yes. And and people say, you know, I know it sounds crazy, but I feel like they're just gonna walk through the door again at some point, you know. Uh I had a woman say to me, her husband died unexpectedly very young. And she said she was at the funeral and she thought to herself, this is going to be so embarrassing when he comes back, you know, that we've had this funeral. Right. And, and, yeah. and so you can both think that's a crazy thought and also really at some deep level kind of feel that it is true. Yeah. It's this, it's, you remind me of this phenomenon where people, it's almost like I've done their death. I've yeah. done that. Now that's great. You can come back now. Yes. And it's it's like there's so many different parts that we've to keep adjusting to. That's you know? right. And and I love that you say it's like these two streams of truth. Yeah. That are there for a while. Yeah. Until we integrate our laws. Yes. And you know the the word confusing and disorientating. Yes. People say I feel like I'm going mad. Yes we're doing such a disservice to the bereaved to not give them this information. Yeah. You yeah. Know? That it is very typical. Yeah. Yeah. And why that's happening. Right. And, and that we can also a little bit, you know, trust ourselves that your brain will sort it out. Right. So if in fact, you know, you go through a whole year of new experiences. You go through the year with celebrating their birthday while they're gone, celebrating Christmas while they're gone, the anniversary of their death while they're gone. Then at least after one year, when you go through it again, you do have a memory of them not having been there at least once. Now that doesn't mean that you don't have to learn new things every year, but it does mean that over time, your brain, which is a prediction machine, right? That is what it is there to do, to learn about what is happening. That if we give it time and experience, then it does update. It does come to understand, ah, this, this is just the painful reality. And given that it is true, what am I going to do now? And so I think what becomes problematic for many people is not allowing themselves to have the experience of the painful reality, either because the pain feels so great that they feel like if I open this door, I'm never going to, you know, I'm just going to fall off a cliff and I'm never going to sort of be functional again, or they just avoid anything that might remind them of the person who's died. Um, you know, so that can manifest in lots of ways, driving miles out of the way so you don't drive by the hospital where they died or avoiding conversations with your neighbors, you know, so that they don't ask you how you are. It, it could be, you know, a hundred different things. But the fact is that that prevents our brain from having that learning experience, which is unpleasant, but does enable us in the long run to figure out how to be in the present moment. And you know, this, this is music to my ears, you know, to hear you say this, because this is what the science tells us. And you know, when you said there, there's so many more people talking about grief nowadays, on one hand, it's wonderful. And on the other hand, there's a lot of myths, yes. or maybe not useful information being shared. Because people who tend to want to talk about it, it's because they've had a really significant loss. Yes. So there may be part of that 40% rather yes. than the broader picture of most people are resilient or flexible. Yeah. And so they've had a shocking experience and then maybe are projecting that universally. Yes. And so giving the message, I suppose what I'm trying to say, I'm seeing a lot of things that are not very hopeful yeah. for the bereaved. 
grief yeah. lasts forever. It's brutal. It'll always be this way. And if I'm someone who's just been whacked in the back of the head by a significant loss, yeah. I know from the people that I've supported, they're looking out there going, show me someone who's survived this and yes. who's okay. Yes. So show me someone who is okay. Yes. And, and we're not hearing so much from those people. Yes. And, and it's interesting, you know, there's a, there's a podcast that I was on that's called Permission to Thrive. And I just think even the title of it, right, is so affirming. And, and I sometimes say, you know, what I think is confusing is that each of us has an individual process. And also as scientists and just as human beings, we look for patterns, right? Well, yeah. those patterns aren't going to apply to each person, but it, you know, it's, um, it's this, it's this mix. And, and I think that one way to think about it, that's helpful because you don't want to misrepresent, you know, there's closure, and your grief will never come back, right? Once you're done, you're done. That's not true. And it's also not true that it won't be the way it feels in that acute um, set of, of moments. It won't feel like that forever. And so a distinction that I like to make is between grief and grieving, yeah. right? So, so grief is that in the moment, you know, that wave we've been talking about, you're sat at a red light and all of a sudden you're dissolved in tears and you think, where did that come from? You know, and, and it feels awful. Having grief, that is just a normal human emotion. And that is going to happen whenever you become aware that someone who is so important is not present in your life anymore. And in that sense, there will be grief moments forever because just as there will be anxiety moments or anger moments or this is just a natural part of a human being but grieving on the other hand is the process and so grieving that necessarily means more than one point in time and so grieving means that there will be times in the future where grief feels different even just because you have more experience with it. So, you know, the hundred, the hundred, the first hundred times you have that wave of grief, you think this is unbearable. I'm, I'm not going to get through this. And the hundred and first time, even if it feels terrible, you may think to yourself, ah, but I know what this is, right? I know this is familiar. And even just that means that grief is different over time because of this process of learning, right? Or you may have less frequent or less intense waves of grief, or you may know in that moment how to reach out for comfort, how to comfort yourself even. And it means that the, the, the wave of grief doesn't scare you as much or doesn't uh, make you assume, ah, now I'm going to feel this way forever, you know? Yeah. And so that, that grieving over time, that change over time, it doesn't happen in a linear way. You know, day two isn't better than day one, better than, you know, and day three isn't better than day two. You go up and down. But in a big picture way, if you look at how you were six months ago, if you look at how you were even two months ago, hopefully there's a change in the way you feel about the death or the loss or what it means for your life or even just the emotions that you experience. Yeah. My brain is wrecked here because I want to go in so many directions with so many things you've said. Well, well, you know, I think I could just add to that because I know you wanted to ask me about prolonged grief disorder. And so... If it's okay, I could say a little bit about that just now. Um, so, so what we look for, what we're concerned about as clinicians is when there is no change over time, right? Where the person a year later is still responding exactly the way they did in that acute set of days and weeks and months. And, you know, so sometimes easiest described in an example. So, I interviewed a woman who met criteria for prolonged grief disorder. And she said to me, never forget, she said to me, you know, she was talking about life feeling meaningless. She said, you know, why would I give my children bar mitzvahs if their grandmother isn't there to see it? And you can see she was just not even willing to engage in these sort of 
rituals that were very important to her extended family because of this death. And this was years after her mother had died. And so you see that it's impacting her in in these ways that mean life doesn't feel meaningful. She's just going through the motions. And and that is, is worrying. And, you know, we know that there's targeted psychotherapy that can help for people who are in those situations, who have found themselves in that trajectory, not because we're going to take their grief away. We just said, you know, it's just a human reaction. You're not going to take it away. But it means they may be able to learn skills that put them back on that sort of more natural trajectory um, with the support of an encouraging therapeutic relationship, they may be able to engage in some of those things they've been avoiding or learn, ah, you know, I'm not really asking for comfort in a way that it feels comforting. And that if I'm able to do that, then I'm able to sort of integrate a great word you keep using, then I'm better able to sort of integrate that grief into my day to day life. And it, it's very much a learning process, isn't it? Very much. So I've and slow. Good- I have a really good example of how I, yeah. I don't think I've ever shared on the podcast, but mm-hmm. um, let's take an example of a couple who come three yeah. years after their son has died in a sudden accident in yeah. South America. And they've come because they want support for the family. Yeah. Um, but it's clear chatting with them, you know, um, one of the parents is missing their son terribly. Um, goes back to the place where their son died every year, yeah. talks about him regularly with his friends, um, cries, has made a memorial garden, um, and goes out and plays golf and is able to talk about his son and has gone back to work, you know, um, and is moving forward with his grief. Um, it's no longer unmanageable. Yeah. Um, his wife, on the other hand, has never returned to work since their son's death, cannot bring herself to go and visit the place where he died, uh, cannot accept that he's gone, so has yeah. photos and shrines of him all over the house. Yeah. Who, and she talks to these photos every day and it provokes intense anxiety in her. Yeah, There's a, 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 an example of, and, yeah. and, and sorry to add, she feels like life is not worth living. She yeah. doesn't want to go on. Life is meaningless and life has no purpose. Yeah. Um, and, and her behavior in the world is a charade and a mask, according yes. to her. So yes. there's an example of three years down, of course, we're still grieving. You yeah. know, of course, you know, there's profound grief. There's loss. We're still talking about our loved one. We always will. Yes, of course. But we've managed to integrate it and re-engage yeah. with life and, you know, find a way to move forward and connect with people where yeah. she didn't. And there's, yes. I think, a good example of an integrated grief versus a yes. prolonged grief disorder that's not integrating and is causing problems. Yes, for the and person it- and their family. And it's usually that person that seeks help. It's yes. not according to popular myth that psychiatrists are running out there going, you are not grieving the right way. And right. you've got a disorder. Yeah. Definitely life has become a bit unbearable, right? And yes, they are absolutely. Support. Is that your That's experience? Right. Yes, absolutely. And, and often are quite relieved to find, ah, it's a very small portion, but there are people like me who are not able to adapt right now and 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 there are researchers who've been trying to figure out and succeeding in finding what interventions will help to get this person back to a point in their life where they they are feeling more integrated with it um i think that one of the challenges is that there is an aspect of grief which we call protest, right? This for many of us happens very early on. And it is that sort of, this cannot be true, right? It's that, but there is a certain anger with it. Like none of you understand that this cannot be true. And none of you understand what I am feeling. And I think that protest 
is so important. It is a, it is a part of the process, but when we maintain that protest, when we are not able to find a way through no fault of our own, when we're not able to find a way to say, ah, but this has happened, then we often are sort of pushing away the people close to us. And that's a very tricky thing to figure out. I think one of the difficulties is, as you've said, grief education is very, very poor in in our culture. And so I think that when people who are experiencing intense grief hear someone, an expert, say, this is a disorder, I think it sounds like everything they've been hearing so far. You're not doing it right. You're, you should be beyond this now. You're, you know, they're just hearing those same messages that they've been receiving, which are not very helpful. But the message is actually different. It is we as clinicians who have seen hundreds of people going through this grief, we understand that you are having a different experience than your family, than your neighbors, than other people who have lost a loved one. We understand you are having a different experience. And because we empathize with that, we're able to find the, the entry points into helping you think about this in new ways and do new things that might help you to learn how it mean, how it is to be bereaved now. And by doing that, we know that it can change how you're feeling about the process of grieving. And that is hugely influential in having people feel that life develops meaning again. Yeah, it's, it's beautifully put there and it, it highlights what a learning experience it is. And yeah. from my experience of doing prolonged grief therapy, it is very much psychoeducation. Yeah. And I often say to people, it's like you're being forced to do a master's degree in loss. Yes. That you don't want to do. Absolutely. But you want to get to the other side of it. You want right. to wear the hat. Yes. You don't want to do it. And um, I think I, I'd love to come back to one of the key parts of your book, which is this notion of time. Mm. and we know that time in itself doesn't heal I think you say in the book if you're to go into a coma for 12 months after a loss and you wake up you're still on day one yeah it's not time that heals it's what you do with the time yeah and it's like it's this paradox of grief like I feel like sometimes we're always giving out these paradoxical or seemingly contradictory messages about grief you know, there's no cure for grief. You've just got to grieve. You've got to feel it. You've got to go through it. But yet also, sometimes there's some hacks, you know? Yeah. Um, we yeah. can hack. Can we learn if we know what's going on in the brain? Can we hack our nervous system? Can we hack our grief response? But yet we don't want to do that too much because grief is a really important human process yeah. that must be gone through. So you know, it's, it, there's all these seemingly contradictory realities. Yeah. But I do find that people who really want to, it's, it's like the grief is okay. I find people can cope with the waves of grief. Yeah. Cope with the sadness or the wailing and feel relief after it because they might have held that up for a while. But yeah. it's all the other stuff that's really mm. confusing. Yeah. Um, or it's if they're keeping that whale in because they're afraid it just will never stop. Yeah. It really sort of turns to something different, like a real mm -hmm. suffering, which yeah. is different to grief. Yeah. Sorry, I know I've said a lot there, but I think you. No, I think you're right. I think, you know, when I say that grieving is a learning process, I don't, I also don't know what each person needs to learn. Right. So for me, after the death of my mother, when I was 26, I developed, you know, I developed panic attacks when I would get on an airplane. And at first you think, well, that's a bizarre response, you know, to grief. What, what is that about? And it took me a long time to realize, you know, that was the moment I wasn't in control of what was going to happen to me. 
And ultimately I realized I was terrified of dying. And that that was the moment where it was most palpable to me that I didn't have any control. And so it took me many years to sort of accept the idea that it was possible that I was going to die that day. And that was sparked because of my mother's death, but it was a whole learning curve kind of separate from just what happened when she died, right? And so I think it can open up these bigger issues for people about their own mortality, about how they feel about their physical body, you know, that, that, you know, that it has the potential to break down on us. And in fact, it will eventually break down on us. It makes us feel different about career choices we've made because maybe we aren't living our values in the way that we now recognize, I don't have a lot of time here. I should probably be doing something else, which is very alarming, you know, thinking, contemplating a job change. And so I think you're right that it isn't just the waves of grief, but that when we have this close brush with mortality, it changes how we understand love and bonded relationships, changes how we understand our own mortality and, and what we are doing in our lives that is meaningful. And those things can come to good ends, having those questions, what am I doing with my life? And how do I make sense of the fact that my loved ones could die? They can end up in good places. We can live more meaningful lives because of it. But you can also imagine how it can just be overwhelming and, and, and shut a person down to have those questions. And it's like, yeah, both exist. If you're willing to unzip and feel these things, it can be it can bring you to really painful places. Yeah. But equally, it can bring you to exceptionally loving places also. Yeah. Where we can experience awe and wonder. Yeah. And not take for granted everything that's yeah. around us. Which that's we it. often that's do, it. right? Yes. You're talking absolutely. about your mom there, and I'd love to come back to that. I I know. You spoke in your book about how she developed cancer, I think, when you were 13. Yeah. Um, and that you only learned later she'd been given a year um, and, and ended up living for, well, 13 more years, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but at some level, it mu you, you must have been aware and that big word yeah. cancer. And as a child, you yeah. know, you talked about the panic attacks as a, a young woman but they really began, I assume, a lot earlier. What was that like? That's like a living loss to live with a parent who's chronically ill. And, you know, it is a brush with death, you know, once yeah. you hear the word cancer. Yeah. Speak to that a little. And I'm sure it's no coincidence that that's why you're here now and doing <laughs> what you do. Yes. You know, every relationship is so unique and 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 also I think when losses happen when you're younger you don't know yourself as well and there's this developmental thing I think that happens which is um I work right now with quite a few youth who have experienced losses and one of the things that was challenging for me and I see in others is that time of your life, adolescence, young adulthood, you are meant to be moving out into the world, right? It is the time of your life where it's developmentally appropriate to leave home and explore. And that is what you are supposed to be doing. And if a loved one is very ill, there is that simultaneous desire to keep returning back and caring for them. And so those two things being in conflict can lead to a lot of conflict between you and the person whom you care for, um, but also a lot of inner conflict. What, what, you know, this doesn't feel right. And you don't have that kind of perspective either because you are a young person. Um, so you don't realize that this tension is partly just because of the developmental point that you're at. You assume, oh, I'm a terrible person for not wanting to, you know, spend all my time at home or, um, how could I be so hard hearted to not want to, you know, visit more often? Um, and so, you know, I think this is just one example of specific issues that come about 
because of particular relationships at particular times in one's life, one's mental health history, all sorts of different things impact our grief and our grieving. And I think it is often both by talking with people who have been there, who get it, right? It's different to go to a support group when you've lost an infant than it is to go to a support group when you've lost a parent or a, or a spouse. And so I think it is important to try and find others who may have been through similar experiences, not because not because they can tell you what to do or or what you need to learn in your own experience. But I I, I like this metaphor of lending someone my glasses, right? Mm. So I have no idea if this prescription is going to work for you, but I'm willing to lend you my glasses and tell you how I see the world. It might bring things into focus that weren't in focus before. And so that may give you some insight. And you may decide, ah, these glasses are perfect for me. But even if you just hand them back, it still has given you an opportunity to see a slightly different perspective. And that may help you as you learn. Absolutely essential. And I think that's back to, you know, the grief that we're seeing online at the moment. We're seeing just one lens a lot of the time. Yes. And I think it's really important that there's lots of people lending glasses. Here's another, yes. <laughs> here's another possibility. Yes. Um, but I just want to name, because it was something like I remember listening, I, I bought your audiobook and I have the, the hard copy and I listened to the audiobook a few times because there was information in it that I, I, I really wanted to, to get, you know, and integrate. Sure. Um, but it really struck me just the ambiguous loss of, yeah you know, a mother being diagnosed and a similarity in my house as well. And it's a loss we don't talk about, the loss of maybe the mother they weren't or couldn't be. Yeah. Um, And that really is formative. Yes. That's really formative. And I think that makes some of us maybe extra sensitive out there in the world or empathy is easier for us. And you also mentioned your parents' divorce. Yeah. Um, and I'm divorced. And actually, that was yeah. one of my motivating Absolutely. factors for doing a master's in loss and bereavement. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? It's like yeah. I need to understand how this is going yes. to impact me and my children. Yes. So I signed up to do a master's. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, this is really where I'm at with sort of where I want to take my work is. Yeah. It's exactly what you said. And I think that's an amazing title. Lend, I'll lend you my glasses. Yeah. You know, we can't, you, you say it in your book and you've said it today a couple of times. Advice doesn't work. Trying to fix no. doesn't work. This is an experience that people need to figure out themselves. Yeah. Yet we can't, we know some things that yeah. can really inform people's choices. Yeah. We know that exercise reduces your cortisol levels. Yes. We know that hugs increase your oxytocin. Yeah. We know that this regulates your system or singing or chanting or deep breathing stimulates your vagus nerve, which settles you. Can we, should we, do we share this with the bereaved? I know I do in my clinic, but can we get a bit better about getting these little nuggets. And with the caveat, which I love, I'll lend you my glasses. Yeah. Play it on if this works for you. See if it works. Take it and run. If it doesn't, zoom over. That's right. That's right. What do you think about saying to people, try the forest? Yeah. Would a weighted blanket help? Yes. Would you go out even if you don't want to? Yes. (laughs) You know, I think we need a big toolkit of ways to deal with with what we're going through. So we need to be, you know, able to just avoid thinking about it at times, right? If you if you have a time where you think, you know, I've given this example before, but you go to your daughter's soccer game, football game, and and you think, I'm just gonna pretend that this hasn't happened for 45 minutes, right? I'm just gonna cheer for her. It's like, life is perfect, nothing has happened, right? And that is denial and avoidance. And in that moment, it is totally appropriate, right? And so I think 
recognizing that we might have to be really flexible was a word you used and, and have different strategies at different times. Well, one of the ways you're going to come up with those different strategies is by talking with people who have had to come up with their own strategies, right? And so you can have a toolkit where, you know, a strategy, you can pull out a strategy that someone's told you about and maybe only use it once, but realize, ah, I hadn't even considered that as a possibility. Um, so, I, you know, I think the problem comes when we use the same strategy all the time, because it doesn't help give us, um, it, it, it doesn't fit with whatever the present moment is. So I give this sort of funny example that I grew up in a very small town. And when my mother was um, in the very last stages of her life, she was in the hospital, of course, and um, she passed away around midnight. And the next morning, my best friend and I got up and we went to the local Mexican restaurant for breakfast. And so the owner came over and said to me, listen, I heard your mom died last night. I'm so sorry. And she said, is there anything I can get you? You can have anything you want. And I said, can I have a beer? <laughs> Not that you're going to say tequila. <laughs> right. And she said, absolutely. <laughs> she brought me that. And what I say is in that moment, that was exactly the right thing that I needed, right? Now, if I woke up every morning from then on and had a beer, <laughs> this would become a problem. <laughs> so I think it is about being able to be flexible. What do you need right now? What are some strategies you might try right now? And, and sort of the trade-off between what's going to work in this moment and what's going to help me in the longer term with my grieving, with my learning process and yeah. trying to keep both of those in mind. And that's like, that's what we need to do. It's like a commitment to yeah. our future self. Yes. What does my future self need me right, to do right now? Yeah. I saw a lovely clip on TikTok, on Twitter today. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know the actor Richard E. Grant. Mm -hmm. He's a British actor. And his wife, Joan, died a little over a year ago. Oh. And she, he's just produced a book called A Pocket Full of Happiness. Mm. She said to him and their daughter, find every day just a little pocket of happiness. And what a gift. Like she instructed yeah. them, yeah. I want you to go out and just find it, you know. Yeah. And we do know that when our world is crumbling, if we yes. can find something that's not crumbling, yeah. It can really be a, an excellent anchor for us. Yes. But I love to, you know, he and he goes running and he shares his pocket yeah. of happiness every day. And every now and again, I see it. But today he shared about putting up the Christmas tree. Oh, and yeah. I just thought, oh, that's so brave and lovely. And it is. He spoke about this was so hard. This was so melancholic. But there it's up. And yeah. It's like, it's exactly what you spoke about, you know, if mm. we can just keep tor turning towards yeah. these moments of grief or the, the, the waves of grief, because we often go, I'm opting out, it's going to be painful. Yeah. But can we go, it's going to be painful and I'm here. Yeah. Because what you've said, what the science tells us is the more we can do that, mm face the grief have a break at the football match yep <laughs> come back and feel the grief again yeah um, you know dosing in and out the more yeah. we can do that the more our grief is going to be integrated and the less suffering we will have in the long run yeah the, the more chances our brain has to update on this new reality that's it yeah absolutely and you know there are so many there are so many difficult kinds of emotions, you know, the person who feels relief that I did when my mother died, that is not an emotion we want to talk about, right? Or, or the person who's not experiencing a lot of grief and they feel, wow, am I totally an automaton? Like, did I not love this person? I thought I loved this person. And some of us don't have an intense grief reaction. Yeah. And there is nothing wrong with that. It is for whatever reason in this moment that you are able to be flexible to, to this is how it is now. And so I, I also don't like to give the impression that the only good response is this intense grief that we all have to sort of figure out how to manage. But yeah. if you're not having that, it doesn't mean you're suppressing anything. 
It doesn't mean you're avoiding anything necessarily. And, and it doesn't make you a bad person to not have intense grief. Yeah, absolutely. And you back to, you know, what we see on social media, there's one of these memes, the depth of grief is equal to the depth of love or something. And it's yeah. just actually not true. Yeah. And it's very damaging yeah. because it's telling people if you are not on your hands and knees, you didn't really love them. And that is yeah. not true. And it's not a message we want to get to people. Yeah. Um, we want them to know that you you are entitled to a yes. good life yes. even if someone you love dies yes you know you're allowed to be happy you've permission yeah. sometimes yeah. people need permission you they know do. yeah um, back to the hacks and I know you're yes. hate me for asking you this but no. it's like you, you, I, I love to give some practical tips mm -hmm. you know yeah um and like I said earlier we know that exercise can help yes we know that deep breathing can help yes. this is all soothing our bodies even doing what i'm doing there a hand in the belly and yeah. a hand on the chest can yeah. make us feel held can make yes. us feel safe in our system again yeah because we're dysregulated after a loss yeah what are some of the really practical things yeah that we know helps mm. like your mm. book is telling us what's going on in the brain mm. what needs to shift and change and adapt Tell us if you can, what yeah. are some, what, what's in the toolkit? Yeah. For some people. Yes, absolutely. Um, so <laughs> the glasses I'll lend is um, uh, a graduate student and I did a, uh, a, an intervention study looking at mindfulness meditation and looking at progressive muscle relaxation, which is just a sort of organized way to in order uh, feel the muscles of your body, contract them, and then let them relax. And to really notice what does it feel like for those muscles to be relaxed. And, and then there was a wait list condition as well, because wait list meaning just, we just asked people the questionnaires over time, but we didn't provide any intervention for them because there is a natural change over time. So we wanted to account for that. And it turned out the progressive muscle relaxation actually showed the earliest impacts for people and were most cleanly different from the people who had no intervention. And mindfulness meditation did also show effects in the long run. Um, but, you know, it is interesting. I think we forget to focus on the body. And, the, and grief is stressful. And so having a way to relax your body and many people will know for themselves what is actually relaxing. Is it a hot bath? Is it, you know, going for a marathon run? Is it, you know, but I think trying some of these things to relax the body can help slow our mind down. It can help re-regulate our hormones and our heart rate and so forth. And all of those are going to benefit us as we try to learn. I mean, imagine trying to learn calculus when you're also really uptight and you haven't slept. And, you know, so I think this learning process can only be helped by having a healthier body. And so I think even empirically doing things like progressive muscle relaxation that will help the body in the long run turned up helping the grief scores as well. Yeah, that's so heartening for me to hear. Um, I'm doing a PhD at the moment and I'm focusing on how grief affects the body and what interventions do we need to look at mm. you know grief is very much a bottom-up experience yeah. it's it's in our nervous well you I'm not preaching to the converses here sure. preaching to the teacher here you know it's 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 in our nervous system therefore it's yeah. everywhere in our body yeah. our nervous system controls our heartbeat our yeah. digestion our hormonal secretion yeah. and so I'm so about you know when people come to me for the first time the prosody of my voice yes you know the the atmosphere I'm inviting them into you know and sometimes and I'd never say this to someone I'm working with and I don't mean to be patronizing but yeah. sometimes it feels like I've someone very young and vulnerable in the room yeah it is like we become a young vulnerable child absolutely in the face of profound loss and we almost need to, you know, as if this is a child who's lost, yeah. help them to feel safe again, 
these yeah. are a lot of um, approaches that can help the bereaved to feel comforted and safe in that yeah. moment. Yeah. And if we can feel it in a moment, then maybe we can repeat that again and again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I think that, you know, one of the things I love about this idea of progressive muscle relaxation is, you know, that can be tacked on to a bereavement support group, right? It can be tacked on, you know, it's not a long process yeah. to spend some time trying to relax the body. And I do also think I, I would just add uh, a, a good friend now, many years ago, her son died. And she, um, she, like many people, actually found it very difficult when people asked her how she was or were very, um, what they assumed was soothing. Now, many people need soothing. I don't disagree with you. But she came up with what I think is the most marvelous phrase. She said, you know, don't treat me with the golden rule. Do as to others as you would have done to yourself. Treat me with the platinum rule. Do unto me as I would want to have done. Yeah. Right. And so each of us is going to find different things comforting. We're going to find our our interactions to be different. And so I think it is a lot also about if you're genuinely invested in this person to whom you are sort of adjacent, <laughs> your grief adjacent, then asking them, does it annoy you when I keep asking you how you are? Is there something that would be more useful? Or is it, you know, can I give you a hug? Is it something that that feeds you when I do that? Um, I think it is trying to find out where they are in helping them to learn and understand where they are. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a question I would often ask is what do you need today? Yeah. You know, yeah. what what's important here? Yeah. Is it silence? Exactly. Is it just sitting together? Yes. Is it trying to figure out something? Is it learning yes. about something? Yes. And and sometimes people come because they just need a bit of reassurance. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, you know what? Everything you're doing is totally normal for your circumstances. <laughs> yeah. Keep yeah. on swimming in the sea and come back yeah. in six months if yeah. you feel like you need something else. Sometimes yeah. people just need reassurance, you yes. know. Absolutely. Um, that, that it's normal what they're going through. Yes. Um, and and people aren't always able to react very well to us, right? So this is part of it. All of the emotions get turned up, don't they? So uh, I had a student who told me that uh, her neighbor, very elderly couple, that the husband had died. And so come Christmas time, her boyfriend went over and said to the widow, Hey, uh, I know your husband always put up Christmas lights. Is that something you'd like me to do this year? Can I put up the Christmas lights for you? And she said, no, I don't need any help with that and sort of slammed the door. And he thought, oh God, I've totally done the wrong thing. How could I be so insensitive, you know, and went home. And 24 hours later, she came back and she said, I just can't bear the fact that he isn't going to put them up. And so I couldn't react to you in the moment. I was just so angry that he couldn't put them up. She said, of course, I would love to have you help me to put those up. And so, you know, I think giving people the sort of benefit of the doubt because they're experiencing so much and yeah. that if it comes from a genuine place of love and support and trying to be aware of what they might need, it doesn't mean it's going to be received well, but it doesn't mean it was the wrong thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. I, I had a teacher who said, show up and shut up. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I, think, I think that was really good advice. Or we have two ears and one mouth, use them proportionately. Yeah. Yes. So, um, and yeah, just to go back to my example, sometimes when people yes. show up, it's when, you know, when there's been a trauma. And when they feel very young and very startled yeah, and, absolutely. you know, it's, I've had someone describe it like my nervous system was outside my body. Yeah. Or it's like the skin is peeled from yes. my system and we Raw. can sense this fragile, fragility. And yeah. sometimes they are in that, or we are in that zone That's it. where the prefrontal cortex is just not kicking in. Yeah. And sometimes there's a little bit of intuition needed. Yeah. 
Yes. So, um, yes. But that's it. It's like it's listening with the body fully. Yeah. Um, and I, I think understanding how grief impacts our body is essential yeah. to anybody yeah. supporting the breed. Um, yes. And, I and agree. Using that for co-regulation. And, yep. Mm -hmm. Um, even just as regular psychotherapists. Yeah. But I'd love to, it's something I'd love to explore further. And I am in my PhD. Wonderful. So, you know, could we do that toolkit with lending you my glasses? Yes. What works for some people. Yes. Try this on. Yes. Um, and yeah, uh, yeah. I'd love to see where that might go. So exciting that the that the yeah. field is growing, you know, that there are so many people contributing what might work and and studying what, you know, what works uh, empirically. It's just marvelous. Well, we learn in school, you know, if you've got a pain in your tummy, eat prunes, drink juice, yeah. you know, yeah. we've learned all about our digestive system. We do that in home economics and yes. in biology. And we learn all these systems in the body. Yeah. We don't learn anything about our attachment system yeah. or relationships, right. the most important thing in the world. Yes. And what happens when we lose relationships yeah. Yeah. and everything, every problem we will ever face is usually at its core to do with a relationship or the loss yeah. of one. Yeah. You know, so yeah. time to bring it in. Any last words of wisdom for the listeners? Boy, you know, I think just the idea that there's no doing it right. You know, I think if we've said one thing today, it's that there are so many ways and you probably are more typical than you think. Um, and, and, you know, just to keep reaching out um, as much as, as, as is possible um, when it feels right. Um, yeah, I think that's all I, I, I'd and leave with. Could I add, even when it doesn't feel right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. Really retreat and, and yet yes. it's connection that can help as well. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. But again, everyone has to find their way, which you have repeatedly yeah. said. Yeah. You know, there isn't one way to do this. Everyone has to find their way. But I love yeah. the idea of borrowing your lenses for a while. Yeah. And learning from each other. Yeah. Thank you so much for your wisdom and your time. I've loved talking to you. I could go on for hours, but I know that you've got probably students waiting for you and a full agenda for your day. So lovely to have this conversation with you, Liz. And thank you for bringing this to people. It's just so important. Well, I really want to recommend your book, which is there behind you, if anyone's on YouTube watching this, The Grieving Brain. I have it right here, actually been sort of following me around for a few months I keep di dipping in and out and, um, <laughs> and I have it on audible also because Wonderful. it's quite sciencey you know there's yeah. there's mm -hmm. and I really wanted to grasp the science of it because of my own research so um it's been a joy yeah. to read and it's been a joy to listen to and thank you for all Thanks. the work you were doing it when the rest of us weren't so really appreciate the shoulders that we're standing on very Wonderful. Fast. Yeah. Thank you.